Welcome, everybody. I'm Ros King. Um, before we start, I have the normal kind of five you know, kind of. Uh, there isn't one planned for this evening, surprisingly enough. So if the alarm sounds, please exit the building bar, the nearest exit, which is just around the corner, and, um, and make your way to the muster point, which is at the far end of the car park behind the tennis courts. Okay, so. Proper welcome now. Uh, welcome to the Reuter Lecture. We're trying to work out um, how many it is. It's well over ten. And these are lectures in honour of Professor Tim Reuter, who is Professor of Medieval History here. This uh, lecture tonight, though, is part of a sequence of um, events that we have been organising with the Southampton City Art Gallery in, in conjunction with an absolutely wonderful exhibition uh, Catch the Castle, which has been curated by Tim Craven sitting over there. Um, so I would urge you to go and see that if you haven't already. And if you want uh, to uh, come to our last event in that series, which is um, Castles and the Culture of, of um, Nation Building, it's a symposium um, which will happen from between 10 and 4 on Thursday of this week at the Art Gallery, and Tim and his co curator will be t taking a tour. Um, with delegates uh, of, of the exhibition at lunchtime. So, that piece of blood over. Um, it gives me an enormous amount of pleasure to uh, welcome John Goodall. John um, is the architectural editor for Country Life. He's also a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries and even sits on the fabric committee of Windsor Castle and various other buildings. Um, he has written the most magnificent, I, I mean, one doesn't, I don't use that word, so to speak, uh, you know, profligately, but it is an absolutely magnificent and huge book, The English um, Castle for Yale. So again, if you haven't seen that, I, I recommend um, you browse through that. Um, and he's, uh, he's taken up the theme of the, um, uh, the Dodie Smith's title for I Capture the Castle, uh, which was uh, which has lent itself to the exhibition and now lends itself to John's uh, lecture. So I'm delighted to welcome you, John. Thank you, Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for that warm welcome. Now I'm going to see if the technology works and plunge us all into darkness. This brilliant. Well, it's also a huge pleasure for me to be here today. Um, when I first was made aware of the exhibition in Southampton Art Gallery, I immediately was interested because writing about castles, I'm aware that there aren't really very many things like that. There are lots of articles and books about castles, endless libraries of these things. But actually an exhibition on them is something quite different and a really interesting uh, perspective, I think, on the subject, an alternative view of castles. I thought when I was asked what subject or what title I would give this lecture that it would be quite interesting to try and do something, as, as, just, as Ros just said, with Dodie Smith's title. Because it seems vaguely witty. I mean, I say vaguely witty. <laughs> <laughs> um, because we are all familiar with the book, but Capturing the Castle actually touches on something that I think is very fundamental to the study of castles, which is very little discussed overtly. But what it is that makes us recognise castles in buildings? The word castle is famously difficult to define. And indeed, as soon as you move into other languages, such as French, the word chateau, is people feel as though they need to define it further when they're talking about medieval castles and call them chateau fort to make it clear that they're, in some sense, real castles. <laughs> And one of the themes of the book, when I was beginning to write the book and trying to define what castles were, was to try and come to grips with what the real castle is. Because one of the complications of dealing these, with these buildings, fundamentally in the Middle Ages, is that the buildings that we call castles are a group, what could have been called many different things by the figures who built them. The word castle in modern English is, in effect, an umbrella term which incorporates all sorts of other terms, or really words rather than terms. We're, I think, slightly obsessed by terms and how we define them. It's one of the things that uh, drives our scholarship, is this desire to isolate and identify. And in some ways, in the castle, it's a very misleading thing to do, because 
we recognise castles for ourselves in a most curious way. And uh, um, the trappings of a castle, what I would term um, <coughs> as well, the things that make us identify castles, are in fact quite straightforward uh, to list. And I want to talk about them today and some of the ways in which they've evolved and been used. This picture is a, a, a picture of a tombstone to Bishop Wyville, uh, the Bishop of Salisbury, who died in the late 14th century. And it shows the bishop in what is quite clearly a castle. <laughs> it's turreted, battlemented, there are arrow loops. And it, in fact, articulates a, a, a bizarre disjunction of image. Because the bishop is a man, by his profession, forbidden to carry arms, forbidden to shed blood, and yet he stands in a building that, to our minds, is all about killing. It is a defensive machine. And in that contradiction of image, a bishop in a castle is a kind of Gordian knot at the heart of the question of what people thought castles were, and indeed what we still think castles are today. And that is that the castle is, in fact, also a status symbol. It celebrates this Bishop Wyville's power as a magnate or lord. But he is himself, as a bishop, both bound up with that authority and status, and yet by his ecclesiastical office distinct from it. What we're seeing here is a prince of the church in his ecclesiastical robes in the architectural setting of a prince of the land, a magnate. Now, the forms that you see on this um, uh, uh, image um, are, we're going to look at in detail, well, some of them we're going to look at in detail and see the ways in which they've evolved over time. And in, in this sense, I'm hoping to you know, evoke back this, the subject of the lecture, how we evoke, how we capture a castle in a building. Because to step out of the Middle Ages altogether, it's important to make the point that buildings can be transformed by the addition of those architectural trappings that I've just shown you. This is a view of Harden Castle on the borders in North Wales in 1809, a neoclassical 18th century house that is just in the process of being transformed, according to the romantic taste, into a castle. It's a wonderful image because it shows what a superficial alteration does to the character of a building. There in the middle is the pedimented elevation of the uh, structure, and you can just see um, the, uh, the, the, the wings with castellations and turrets emerging. And this is what Harden looks like today. Uh, it's quite interesting to notice that that central tower to which the composition culminates uh, is in fact the former pediment of the 18th century house. So that illustrates, in a way, how superficial, how cosmetic castles and their evocation can be. Where does this vocabulary come from? How has it developed? How has it played with? And how has it evolved in the Middle Ages? Before I deal with any of those questions, I think it's very important, very quickly, to introduce the subject of what castles are. Because I think people are very good at describing different types of castles, but they don't often come to the kind of crux of what they're really studying in origin. Because although there are debates about where castles first originate in England, the story of their development is in some ways quite straightforward. There did exist in the Anglo-Saxon world fortified noblemen's houses. It's quite clear that they existed. But at the Norman Conquest in 1066, England went through an extraordinary architectural revolution. And the greatest magnates, who were given huge parcels of land by William the Conqueror, constructed buildings on a scale simply unknown since the Roman period in Britain. Very significantly, many of these structures, though by no means all of them, were in stone. And the buildings that they were evoking in these buildings were indeed Roman buildings. Stone, by its unyielding qualities, is a material that evokes explicitly, I think, in, in an, certainly in the 11th century mind, the splendours of Rome. And it's a connection underlined, of course, by the church and uh, the connections of the church with the papacy in Rome. This is probably the best, 11th, best preserved 11th century castle in Europe. It's Richmond in Yorkshire, 
Um, begun in the decade, uh, probably in the 1080s, uh, an extraordinary uh, a castle begun by a very close follower uh, of William the Conqueror, the Duke of Brittany. It's dominated today by a 12th century tower, and I'll be talking a little bit more about those in a moment. Richmond came into existence because a group of estates were handed over to the Duke of Brittany and their resources were turned towards the construction and the, uh, and the uh, <coughs> organisation of the castle. This is a map of Yorkshire showing um, groups of estates given to some of the great castles in Yorkshire. Of course, an area absolutely laid low by the harrying of the north and completely restructured uh, by William the Conqueror in the aftermath of the conquest. And you'll see the cluster of estates in the top left-hand corner there. It's Richmond and the castle is sort of in the middle. But there are other major estates. You can see Pontefract, Tickhill, Skipsey, um, uh, 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 dotted around, and, and Richmond has plenty of outlying estates around York itself. So this is an inherited land pattern of manors that William the Conqueror takes over from a, 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 a disgraced member of the Anglo-Saxon elite, so it's, a, a, it's an identifiable group of estates, and they're simply passed over as a group, and the resources of that estate go towards the construction of a castle. The castle itself, however, is not just an entity um, in, in, in isolation with these estates. It's actually brought into being with an entire settlement. There's a whole economic um, a game beside the foundation of castles. And if you look at the plan of Richmond today, you can quite clearly see that what happened here was that a, a great circular enclosure on top of a hill, almost certainly unoccupied previously, was created. And the castle was cut like a slice of cake from that enclosure as an entity within it. Now, fascinatingly, if you look at early Ministry of Work plans and guidebooks of, 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 of Richmond, they only look at the triangle of the castle. This is, to f this is fundamentally to misunderstand the nature of what is created at Richmond in the 11th century. It's not just a great nobleman's fortification. It's an economic unit, and it's living off the land that it's been given. It's also protecting a very uh, disturbed border area, staking out uh, territory. So here you can see the castle at the bottom left-hand corner, a, a barbican, the protection of the gate, um, around the front of the castle, a huge marketplace, and then around the walls, a series of radiating burgage plots for the new settlers of this town come castle. Nearly all 11th century castles come with these grand town foundations. And I suppose more than anything else, they express the enormous ambition that uh, so distinguishes the Norman noblemen, <laughs> or you know, those who come over with the conquest. They're just given these vast plots of land, and they just do whatever they want with them. And they conceive things on an enormously grand scale. The properties that are gifted to the Duke of Brittany with his castle are then given in turn by the Duke of Brittany to his immediate followers. <laughs> They're kind of gifted down the food chain of the feudal settlement. And in return for these properties, the figures he gives them to both serve roles within his household and they also agree to uh, undertake castle service in the castle of Richmond. This is a fantastically early English topographical drawing. It's probably drawn in around 1400, and it shows Richmond Castle in its recognisable modern form. Around the walls are a series of coats of arms, and each coat of arms relates to this list below, and it simply says, it identifies the places on the walls for which each of these figures who've been given bodies of estates by the, the, the Lord of Richmond, the area of the walls of Richmond that they are responsible for protecting as night service. Interestingly, the, the richest of these figures, the figures who are given the most land, actually also build castles on their own estates. And so what you have is a situation where a great nobleman builds a big castle, and his followers have, it, it, this big castle has children, in effect. <laughs> his, his followers have smaller castles on their own estates. And um, they are, in turn, serving a role in the castle. Now, 
that it's very complicated. It's not a straightforward document to interpret this. There are many questions about how castle service was actually performed, whether it was always performed in relation to specific areas of a castle, of a great castle. But setting those points aside, the important point to drive home is that a castle is a body of estates, land, incredibly important, which is being gifted away to other people who serve the property, and monasteries too are, in, are endowed out of this body of lands. And so a castle is in itself the architectural manifestation of an entire landholding and living structure. It's not just sort of some abstract thing that pops up somewhere. It's actually bound up with economic and living realities. It is an architectural manifestation of the feudal settlement in its original form. Now, over the Middle Ages, castles, new dark castles develop, old castles sometimes get thrown away by the wayside. The peak number of castles in England is probably reached uh, in the late 12th century. And thereafter, numbers are almost continuously in decline. But whatever their form, <laughs> They are all, as I say, expressions of land ownership. And I would characterise the land ownership, I would sort of complicate it by saying that rather as the image I showed you of Bishop Wyville, the Bishop of Salisbury, expresses princely authority, so castles are understood to express, on the one hand, rights of ownership over property, the foundational substance of the medieval economy. They express the military vocation of those who live in them by their uh, battlements and fortifications. Knightly service is the professional world of the ruling class of medieval England and of Europe as a whole. But as time progresses also, and I want to talk about this briefly further on down the line, castles simply come to represent time out of mind. They are the architecture of the ancient past. You can renew them, you can do wonderful things to them, but let's say, as with the Tower of London in London, they come to represent almost the mythical, the foundation myth of English political history. And that, of course, is a foundation myth that takes an incredible kicking in the Civil War after the execution of Charles I, or a rat in the 1640s and 1650s. But until that time, they are, just as English law and English monarchs number themselves from the conquest, so castles sort of become the thing that links you with the foundation myth of the political settlement in medieval England. And it is unbroken until the mid-1640s. Well, <laughs> many castles um, are built, uh, of course, after the conquest in timber, and we only have their surviving earthworks. Um, we know very little about what these buildings looked like, though the Bayer Tapestry, which I'm showing you a detail of at the top, and the massive earthworks at Thetford uh, at the bottom, they do give us some idea of what these castles looked like. It's very easy, I think, to think, well, it's very easy to assume that timber frame buildings, because they don't exist anymore, and we're at a loss really to try and reconstruct them in any detail, were not significant objects. But when you walk up and down, let's say, the Mott at Thetford, you realise they were absolutely titanic structures and they represent vast investments of labour. In fact, if you want to comprehend the cruelty, almost the slave labour of the Norman Conquest, you just have to try and scramble up that, that great hill in the middle. This is, takes thousands of man-hours to raise uh, in a relatively small um, economy with presumably relatively small numbers of people working at them. But we may have some clues as to what these buildings look like. This is a slightly frivolous illustration of the point, but I hope you can see um, on the left I'm showing you the church tower at Earls Barton. You see these curious little projecting strips of timber. I'm showing on the right a porch at Ludlow <laughs> um, of the 17th century. I hope you can see that those strips of timber on Earls Barton may just be skewmorphs. That's to say, stone representations of wooden architecture. It's not impossible. Um, it, as I say, it's a spurious comparison, but it's not impossible that what you see in some stone buildings is representations of lost timber architecture. And by implication, we get a sense again of the physical ambition of the timber structures that have vanished. 
But I really want to talk today about stone buildings because we know so much more about them. And I also want to make a quick point about English architecture as opposed to other kinds of architecture. It's very difficult talking about national styles of design and um, in, in, in any artistic field. But I think it is important to understand that in England particularly, the monarchy drives forward the whole evolution of architecture. Architecture is vastly expensive. It's, it breaks, even as today, <laughs> rich people build buildings and then they find themselves to be much less rich than when they began <laughs> because up the bills of architecture are basically enormous. <coughs> The state is a major player today and then in the patronage of architecture. And the English crown and the English masons who build for the crown determine, in some ways, a national style of architecture. They drive forward the development of architecture in the Middle Ages as they do afterwards. Now, the style of architecture they build in is... I think it's, much, it's quite difficult to sort of articulate in any particular ways what it's like or what constitutes it. But there are, every now and again, striking contrasts or themes that allow you to say there are things that are sort of distinctively English about English buildings. It's a bit like language. You know, uh, la our English is influenced by many different languages, and yet there, are, there is a, you know, a, a grammar and so forth and a vocabulary that defines it, while even so it's very open to outside influence. I'd just like to point out two things that are very English about English castles. The first thing is that English castles tend to have leaded roofs and flat rectilinear outlines. I'm showing you here a mid-15th century view of Windsor Castle. And I hope you can see that it's basically a battlemented building, and it's taken slightly from a bird's eye view, but all the roofs that you see are in flat, fact, flat leaded roofs that you could walk on. Indeed, I think I can use this. We actually know that these roofs here are used by, um, uh, used by the king uh, to walk on. They're connected with his, uh, with his council chamber, and you can walk on the leads to relax. Now, this is in some ways in total contrast to French architecture of the 14th century. This is a view from, of course, the Trérichet of the Duc de Berry of the Louvre. And it's a 13th century castle in its, in, in, in its form as represented here. But I hope you can see these high roof lines. It's like a Disney castle, in fact. This is what the French love, and it's also, if I were to show you, I don't know, a drawing by Dürer or something, if you can visualise that in your mind. Again, very spiky buildings, uh, Cranach views of castles too, in Germany, very sort of spiky uh, uh, structures. Now, this fascination in France with high roof lines persists right into the 17th century. This is Vaux le Vicomte, the mid 17th century, um, uh, and uh, famously constructed by Fouquet. Um, and you can see these massive roofs. If you were to take a head on view of this house, I'd say the top third is tile. Just compare that with something like this, Bess of Hardwick's Hardwick Hall. There's not a roof to be seen. It's absolutely flat. This is what the English love. And when you get to buildings in the 17th century, such as Boughton, which claim to be very French, it's one of the things that appears is the roof, but nothing like as grandly conceived as French contemporary French examples. So this is a very clumsy contrast, but I hope it makes the point. There are idioms and differences. Now, setting those aside, let's just think about some of the elements that constitute um, English uh, castle buildings. The most fundamental, perhaps, in everybody's mind is the battlement, the stepping up and down of stone, which is a feature found, of course, in Roman uh, buildings. You can see depictions of battlements on Trajan's column and so on and so forth. Very long-standing and familiar architectural form. But in castles, and I'm showing you a picture of Bedford Castle from Matthew Paris's uh, Chronica Majora, um, in, in, in England, they take on a very special significance. In the late Middle Ages, there is, as some of you may know, an entire class of documents which are uh, a, 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 a class of documents which are issued by the Royal Chancery, giving people permission to fortify their houses. 
Now, these documents have been dubbed by 19th century scholars licenses to crenellate, because one of the things they com commonly incorporate is an explicit permission to build teeth of stone, battlements, crenellations on houses. Now, as a matter of fact, there are lots of exceptions to this, and it's really confusing, but just put that to the back of your mind. The first license to crenellate of the late 12th century, for example, gives permission to build a wall but no battlements, uh, weirdly, at Haddon Hall in Derbyshire. But just park that. Normally, they give explicit permission to build walls with battlements. And battlements are somehow understood to be the things that define defensive structures for obvious reasons. These documents of themselves are often issued as what are called letters patent. Now, a letters patent is simply a charter with a seal which is public. And I'm showing you the license to crenellate of the late 15th century for Oxborough Hall in Norfolk on the left. And the bottom right, I'm showing you uh, uh, of something from Beverly Minster. It's St John of Beverly founding Beverly Minster after the Battle of Brunneberg. And I hope you can see that the king is giving St. John a charter, an open charter with a seal attached. These open charters are pronouncements. This is a demonstrative picture illustrating a moment of foundation and donation. And that's a really important element of these charters. And famously, we have at least one example. This is Cooling and Kent, uh, uh, built in the 1380s, which has a demonstrative charter actually attached to the outside of the building. You might just be able to see this charter here is just there on the towers. And it's an, in, it's an inscription in English talking about the castle as having been created for the defence of the country, of the countryside. So there's a very interesting idea that battlements and charters are demonstrative, this public function, um, uh, uh, and that there's something almost quite theatrical about them uh, and, and self-conscious and demonstrative about them. Well, as you might expect in such circumstances, battlements turn up everywhere in medieval art. And I just show you three examples. I'm showing you a water stoop at Battle in Kent with little decorative battlements on the inside. This is Bodleian Castle in, uh, in Sussex with battlements on the top of the chimney piece. And of course, I'm showing you here a um, uh, 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 South Wingfield Manor with chimneys with miniature battlements on the top. Because battlements express military service. And when you have anything grand and you want to dignify it, therefore, you stick battlements on it. Now, battlements themselves are a very straightforward idea. But from very early on, there are really interesting games being played with battlements. And some of them are quite surprising. I'm showing you here a picture of the Great Tower at Rochester, one of the great uh, buildings of the 1120s in England, built by Archbishop William de Corbet, the Archbishop of Canterbury. And you'll just see around the top of the walls, you might be able to see there are these stone openings running around the walls. I tried to find a photograph. The openings, basically, this is the very top of the tower. The openings just come through at this level uh, of the wall walks. And we have a seal for the city of Rochester um, of the, um, uh, the late 13th century. And I hope you can see that these sockets are depicted in this image of the castle at Rochester. And out of some of them, there project little wooden beams. It's almost certainly the case that these are the seatings for what, uh, 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 for what are called hordes, which is a kind of wooden structure built over the head of a wall that allows you to walk out over the edge of the wall and look down to the base of the tower. These are hordes, so-called, are, are, are described in some royal documents as being constructed on castles in time of war. It's a way in which castles became warlike uh, structures. And I want to come back to this in, in one moment uh, in another building. They would have effectively boxed in the upper part of the castle and made it uh, more effective in, uh, uh, in defensive terms. Now, the idea of projecting out battlements is also translated into stone in the late 13th century in England. And it caused what, it's, what is dis termed a machicolis. This is when, instead of having battlements at the head of the wall, you basically build out little steps and you build the battlements 
forward from the front of the wall. And this creates a space between the head of the wall and the battlements, which allows you to look down to the ground between, uh, 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 and command the base of the wall. This is the first English example I'm aware of, of a Mashikalis. It's in Conway, in North Wales, one of Edward I's uh, castles of uh, uh, the, 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 the 1270s in Wales. Absolutely spectacular uh, building. Now, projecting the battlements over the front of the wall is one way of ornamenting a, a wall, creating an, an interesting architectural effect. But you can do other things with battlements too, which are quite as surprising. This is Pembroke in North Wales, a great tower begun by the Earl of Pembroke almost certainly at the very close of the th uh, 12th century. And uh, this is what the castle looks like. I'm sure many of you have been there. Absolutely wonderful uh, building. Um, uh, I don't need to talk about that. This is a view of the tower by Francis Place in the late 17th century. And I hope you can see that the tower has quite distinctly one, two, three layers of battlements. And if you walk to the top of the tower today, you can see this. The structure is actually domed at the top. And here we have a drawing showing one, two, three layers of battlements. We also have, if I can just go back for one moment, we have, as at Rochester, these funny little sockets um, for uh, a hoard at the top of the building. <laughs> but I'd just like you to notice one thing. The triple battlements here must be demonstrative. They must be, it's like a papal tiara sitting on top of a, of a great tower. But if you build a hoarding around them, you wouldn't be able to see the battlements. So the hoardings, I think we can reasonably assume, would only have been erected at time of war. In other words, castles are architectural entities that you dress for warfare much as you might prepare for action in an 18th century battleship. In other words, they're not always ready for war. They have a peaceful and a warlike persona. And indeed, this is talked about in some contexts. In knightly terms, of course, there is the contrast uh, between arms of war and arms of peace. If you were uh, going, um, if you were a knight in the late 13th century, you might have your coat of arms, and if you rode with your coat of arms displayed, you were a knight on your way to war. But if you were going to a tournament, you might have a completely different emblem or coat of arms, not a coat of arms, an emblem, which were your arms of peace. And we do have descriptions of this, people being worried about tournaments because people seem to be there with their real arms of war rather than their arms of peace. Of course, tournaments are very worrying things for kings because lots of uh, knights can be getting together and preparing to wage war on them. So this idea of a peaceful and a warlike persona, that one is actually quite theatrical. There is no military explanation, as far as I'm aware, for a triple tiara of battlements, but it looks very splendid. <laughs> if this building is actually at war, it might be invisible. The Earl of Pembroke was, of course, a major landowner in South Wales. And what's quite interesting is there are, in fact, a group of at least four castles that possess towers that had arrangements of battlements similar to that found at Pembroke itself. This is Kidwelly Castle, and I hope you can see that this inner bailey, one of the towers has a dome on, and I strongly suspect that that had an inner order of battlements. It's a kind of architectural homage of a, someone who is a knight to the Earl of Pembroke constructing a castle with a miniature version of the great tower that defined his master's castle. Now, in the 13th century too, there are really significant changes going on in the way that people use battlements. And this may sound a rather fatuous thing to say, but it's incredibly important, and it ties in with what I've been talking about, about the theatrical use of battlements. Until the late 13th century, if you built a great hall, it commonly looked, as I show you at the top, like this. This is um, a, a Stokeser Castle in Shropshire, and I hope you can see that the Great Hall has a sequence of gable, water gables, each one housing a window along its side walls. We know, for example, that Henry III's Hall at Winchester, which some of you may know, originally had gables in this form. But in the late 13th century, there appears for the first time the use of a hall with battlements. <laughs> now, I can't emphasise strongly enough that 
the expectation, I think, of a late 13th century person was to see a hall that looked like Stokesay. But I'm showing at the bottom the end wall of a colossal hall built by the Bishop of Wells, Burnell, um, in Wells. It's now a ruin, it's in the it's remains of the Bishop's Palace, and I hope you can see that the end wall is battlemented. That would have looked utterly bizarre, and it's also contradictory, because it's not really a fortified building, it's a building using battlements for spectacular effect. And it's quite different from what had been going on in great hall buildings before this time. After this point, battlements turn up simply everywhere. In the late Middle Ages, they appear as much on churches, and I'm showing you here Holy Trinity Hull of the late 14th century, one of the grandest parish churches ever constructed in England. Uh, and you can see battlements at every level on this building. They're not for war. <laughs> but they are for demonstration. And of course, they're panelled and decorated and cut through as a lattice, uh, just to show how rich and splendid they are. They're bestowing on these buildings, these churches, dig the dignity of a castle, and evoking perhaps to the heavenly Jerusalem and other things. Historians of castles are often obsessed with the idea that ultimately the architecture of these buildings is explained by warfare. And I, it's not untrue, but I just think that in the light of what I said, I need to just make one more pass at this idea, just to drive home the idea that castles, too, are concerned with aesthetics and aesthetic effects. This is Edward I's great castle at Carnarvon. Historians of castles often treat Edward I's castles as the greatest essay in defensive architecture in medieval English history. Well... Just notice one really peculiar thing about this building. It is a very strong castle. It has a magnificent thick walls and is spe spectacularly detailed, crenellations and arrow loops, etc., etc. But notice one thing about it. These arrow loops and these arrow loops down at the bottom are in fact completely fake. They don't light anything or open onto anything. They're just notches cut in the wall. They're to give the illusion that this is a spectacular particularly defensible and strong castle. They contribute nothing towards its defence and never could have done. There's absolutely no way of reaching that arrow loop. So there is theatre in castles and their aesthetic is one of strength and fortification. That's a really important point to make. Now, linked in with battlements is another weird and wonderful detail that is very difficult to rescue, I think, uh, from the evidence available. And this is the chimney. <laughs> the chimney has a very particular and interesting history in England. I'm showing you the fragments of a chimney excavated from Old Sarum, uh, 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 from the Bishop's Palace in Old Sarum, and now in the Salisbury Museum. I hope you can see this sort of rather strange pile of early 12th century carved elements to a chimney. Now, weird as it may sound, England has a tradition of elaborate chimney pots that is paralleled nowhere else in Europe. There are very grand sets of chimney pots in many French buildings. I showed you the Tres with its wonderful uh, chimneys. But in England, the idea of ornamenting them goes in a very strange and unexpected direction. So we have this, the earliest carved English chimney pot, ornamented to a degree unparalleled in any 12th century example that I'm aware of, and certainly uh, not paralleled outside England. Well, from that moment onwards, England's chimney pots just get grander and weirder. <clears throat> I'm showing you a reconstructed chimney pot uh, uh, um, in, in North Wales with a hunting horn on the top. This is from Conisborough, this extraordinary, crinkled, uh, abstract chimney pot. And here, Grossmont, a particular favourite, uh, a castle of, of Grossmont, a late 13th century chimney, which culminates as a, a, a pillar. At Conway, that I showed you before, you can't see very clearly, but each of these chimney pots has a sort of crown-like structure of the late 13th century, integrated on its upper rim, almost certainly an advertisement of the fact that it, they are heating, they're the chimneys of the royal apartments uh, beneath. And I've shown you already Wingfield, or here Tattershall Castle, this wonderful chimney pot with battlements integrated both at the top and on the sides of this great 15th century chimney piece. And we even have chimneys that evoke in miniature entire buildings. 
This is Max Stoke in Warwickshire, and I'm showing you a detail of one of the chimney pots here. Almost certainly, the source of this chimney pot is a, 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 a Caesar's Tower um, at Warwick Castle. Do you see it has this sort of projecting level of battlements and an upper level of battlements above? We know that the masons involved at Maxstoke also worked at Warwick Castle. And in the Tudor period, chimneys became constructed of brick. In fact, in the mid-15th century, people begin to construct chimney pots of rubbed brick to give this extraordinary effect uh, at the palace at Richmond, constructed by Henry VII. Do you see all these brick chimneys enlivening the battlemented outline of this building? We know exactly what those chimneys look like because a copycat building at Thornbury in Gloucestershire still survives with chimneys of about 1515, 1510, 1515. Um, and I hope you can see this, these chimney pots, they're very elaborately carved with abstract patterns, but at the top we've got battlements and even little arrow loops carved in the top of the chimney. Now, I want to digress for a moment and enter into another weird world of architectural uh, media, well, I can say, well, architectural evolution. I'm juxtaposing the chimney with a window at Thornbury. This is another very bizarre English fascination, what is often called a compass window. You can see it's a window with a very complex geometry, with sort of balloon-like openings at its upper level and a star-shaped plan at its lower level. There is really no very obvious explanation for why English masons became fascinated with compass windows of this form. But as we'll see, they're a mainstream idea of 15th, 16th and 17th century English architecture. Now, it's just possible that one source for these ideas is indeed the design of chimney pots, where, as you can see, we have this incredibly complex geometry being worked out in the design of the chimney pots themselves. Look at this wonderful wave-like pattern, for example, in the middle, middle chimney pot. But there is also, notwithstanding that possibility, there is also another really interesting way in which English castle design can be seen to have influenced the design of these great windows. Now, you're going to have to bear with me, because this is quite a complicated idea. Sorry, this is, um, doesn't matter. This is Burley, again, looking at the chimney pots at, uh, at Burley in the late 16th century. Another example. This is a plan of Nottingham Castle, which was demolished at the end of the Civil War. Of course, it's the place where Charles I famously raises his standard uh, uh, at the very beginning of the Civil War. This is a plan of the castle before it's demolished. And I want to just look in detail at this part of it. This is a building begun by Edward IV in the 1470s and completed by Richard III before his deposition um, in 1485. It takes the form of an enormous tower with, I hope you can see, a series of windows facing into the courtyard. So there's a block here with windows on the inside and a huge tower on the outside. Now, although it's been demolished, we do actually know something of what this building probably looked like, both from description, but also because there exists another building, almost certainly, that inspired it. This is the, build the principal structure of Cardiff Castle, of course, transformed in the 19th century magnificently by William Burgess um, for the Marquis of Butte. But I hope you can see that this is uh, in, beneath Butte's alterations. There's a great big tower on the outside, that's the top of it, and on the inside a building block with a series of windows. Some of these are actually 19th century. But I hope you can see, if I just go back, projecting windows, big tower, projecting windows, big tower. Okay? This is what Cardiff looks like in the uh, 18th century. Here's the big tower on the outside, and this is the inside wall with these projecting towers. Now, we know exactly where the idea for these projecting towers came from. <laughs> it came from one of the defining works of English architecture constructed by Edward III in the second half of the 14th century at Windsor Castle. The most intimate part of this palace complex and a room set aside for the, uh, for, for the king himself was in this tower, st which still survives, called the Rose Tower. I'm showing you a drawing here. Do you see the rose tower is just here? Do you see it's a projecting block, a projecting tower with windows on each face? This projecting tower undoubtedly is the inspiration for this tower at Cardiff. Uh, 
Can you see what I'm working towards? And in fact, this Cardiff structure, in other words, is borrowing from this very exclusive and familiar tower and reproducing these forms along its inside face. So we have a sequence. We have the Rose Tower at Windsor inspiring a building at Cardiff with multiple projecting towers and windows inspiring a much grander royal copy in the late 15th century at Nottingham. Now, this basic idea of a block with windows at the front and a tower at the back actually turns up in English architecture of the 16th and even the 17th centuries. Look at this Gawthorpe in Yorkshire. Look at that, the tower at the back and this run of windows at the front. It's not beyond the bounds of possibility that what you're actually seeing in a completely different architectural idiom is an idea developed in English castle architecture of the late 14th century. The idea of these towers with multiple windows goes on in English castle architecture to have a long history. And one of the most elaborate examples of a spy tower, as it's called, is at Warwick. This upper level overlooked the parks at Warwick and allowed people to watch the hunting from the comfort of the castle itself. And I hope you can begin to see that this is beginning to have a very complicated plan indeed. It's beginning to be crinkled in odd ways. This is a tower of the 1480s. And I'm showing you here Peacock Court at Knoll Park, probably of the late 14th, uh, 15th century too, with these, what's almost become a wall of glass um, uh, on the inside of this building. That's what Peacock Court <laughs> looks like at Knoll from the inside. I hope you can see the whole wall has just dissolved into glass. These ideas are almost certainly derived from the series of buildings that I've shown you already. So we have these complicated compass windows, and their origin is potentially in chimneys and castle design. I show you this particular example because it's the very antithesis of what people expect. They think castles go out of fashion. Castles take over the world. <laughs> and just a 17th century design, just to show you, this is um, a 17th century draftsman's book with all these complex com compass designs, just showing these ideas are still alive. Now, the last thing I want to talk about, because we don't have very much time, is um, almost uh, th is this other element that I've talked about, the sense in which castles are time out of mind buildings, that they represent history since the foundation myths of English, uh, of, of English history. Now, in order to understand this, I think also we need to make that a very difficult intellectual leap and understand that we need to, to understand this issue properly. We need to be capable of say, making the mistakes that 16th and 17th century historians and commentators made. I just want to show you a very simple example of this, not to sneer at it, but just to make the point. Um, Inigo Jones, celebrated court architect of the early 17th century, famously thought that Stonehenge was a Roman Ionic temple, a Doric temple. Now, um, we know that Stonehenge is not Roman at all, and it seems absurd. And yet, through the works of his follower, um, he created designs for Stonehenge which regularised the plan and turned it to his eye into a Roman monument. We need to be capable of making the same mistakes. And of course, when you look at a building like the Tower of London, you need to remember that even into the 18th century, this building was regarded not as a building necessarily constructed by William the Conqueror, but Caesar's treasury, constructed after his first landing in Britain. When you see this building as Caesar's treasury, you see a very different history from the one that we see today. You see, as I say, a kind of foundation myth building. Now, the Roman origins of many, the early you know, 12th, 11th and 12th century architecture is called Romanesque because it is evoking the forms of Rome. And at somewhere like Porchester, near to here, we have, of course, a castle occupying and reusing Roman building materials in, in what is effectively a Roman style, though creating a building that could only have existed uh, in the Middle Ages. What's interesting, though, is that these great towers that are constructed, keeps that are constructed in so many castles, do become familiar to people as Roman buildings. This is another building at Dover, which is written about over and over again into the 16th and 17th century as Caesar's Tower. 
just skip through. Am I going to skip through these? Sorry, forgive me. And of course, one of the uh, this is Corfe Castle, famously much reproduced in the exhibition in the uh, Southampton uh, Art Gallery. Um, another very early building, dominated by this huge tower. Now, we tend to see these buildings as gaunt barrack-like structures, or certainly medieval buildings that are simply ruinous. It's very important to remember that Corfe is, in fact, demolished at the Civil War, and that prior to the Civil War, it was a very comfortable and exclusive building. The Great Tower was remodelled, we know, with classical sculpture erected on the parapets. This is a reconstruction I did with uh, Chris Jones Jenkins for a Country Life article about the 17th century history of Corfe and its remodelling. This is an 11th century building that's actually in use and being adapted for luxurious life 700 years after its first construction. 600 years after its first construction. Quite incredible. Difficult to think of many buildings uh, in currency still that could claim that. Now, here we need to understand that there's a really interesting divergence in historiography. I'm showing you here Bolsover, built by the Duke of, completed by the Duke of Newcastle um, in the early 17th century, and written about by many authorities as a Gothic revival building. The point being that here we have a figure who's a, a, a knight, and he is interested in reviving Gothic medieval ideas in England. Well, that's sort of true. As we, if you accept, if you know that these great towers were constructed in the Middle Ages. But just imagine if you thought that great towers were actually constructed by Caesar, and you happen to be madly keen on reviving classical ideas. This is Inigo Jones's designs of Oberon Castle, Oberon's Castle for a court mask in the early 17th century. And as I say, it's been described as being medievalizing. But I'd like to suggest to you that if you thought that buildings like Dover were actually constructed by Julius Caesar, that isn't Gothic, it's actually neoclassical. In other words, that many of these buildings are in fact, castle buildings are in fact evoking classical forms. And that the whole view of them is not of exclusively medieval things, but of classical things. That just as Inigo Jones is designing the banqueting house, when he designs Oberon's castle, he may actually be imitating what he regards as homegrown classicism, not something Gothic at all. In fact, it isn't Gothic in any way. This theme of classicism in castles actually has an existence long beyond the Middle Ages. I'm showing you Robert Adams' Killane on the west coast of Scotland. It's a building that is castellar, but unmistakably evokes Roman ruins. It's something that sort of teeters on the brink between 18th century elegance, <laughs> classical history, and medieval romanticism. And it's a really fascinating illustration of how these three themes can sort of be in, uh, collected together in one single building. And as a final point, because I must stop now, the buying into ancestry and representing ancestry in castles is one of the obsessions of the aristocracy of the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. This magnificent building is, um, the, is Boris in Ireland, owned by the descendants of the kings of Leinster. It takes castellar form. It's constructed in the 1810s with amazing plasterwork internally of the of, of very fashionable, but externally it is a castle form. And internally it possesses heirlooms of the family of the kings of Leinster, such as this drinking horn. It's actually a replica of the original, which is now in the National Museum of Ireland. And every window on this building is flanked by the figure of a king of Leinster and his queen. <laughs> it's a sort of expression in the early 19th century of the lineage of this family. And inside the house, inside the library still today, is this astonishing, luxurious manuscript history of the family. It's a family tree commissioned from the King of Arms of Ireland at enormous expense. It cost several hundred pounds to produce in the 1810s, um, and it's an illustrated history of the king's themselves. This is a sort of evidence that the house, the house is made to look ancient, and this is the lineage of the family. <laughs>
And it's something expressed, this like, desire to buy into history, is something expressed too in, um, much, uh, in buildings of the same period. This is, of course, Penryn in North Wales, uh, which has this magnificent great tower uh, tacked onto one end um, uh, 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 as a, uh, as a reference, in fact, modelled on Castle Headingham in Essex, but a reference to that. Well, I hope in this short talk I've made you think slightly differently about castles. I've deliberately tried to break out of um, t time zones. I feel they're very unhelpful when looking at a castle. Um, a, a castle is ultimately a building which is very much in the eye of the beholder. And its superficial forms can be played with in different cultures and environments in very sophisticated ways in indeed. And indeed, this idea of ancestry is one, uh, the, the, the idea of castles as expressing ancestry is very, very important, I think, in the 18th and 19th centuries and the interest in their revival. It's not just a romantic revival. It's uh, many Tory landowners are builders of castles and it's expressing something about the way in which they see themselves. So we, these figures also were capturing the castle in a way. They were using this image, trying to reproduce this form uh, in a way that spoke to their contemporary world. And when we, when, as I hope you will, you'll go and see the exhibition, if you haven't done already, in the Southampton Art Gallery. I hope you'll see, on top of all the wonderful things that are there, there is, in fact, another history to be written about and thought about, about how these castles have been used and understood in different contexts. Thank you very much indeed. Shall we put the lights up a little bit? Oh, sorry. That's great, thank you. Thank you, John. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, um, we've all been familiar with these icons, haven't we? These, these crenellations. I mean, um, and quite unable to say whether uh, a crenellation actually dates from the... 12th, 13th, 14th, 16th, 17th, or, or 19th century. I mean, my local castle, when I was uh, growing up, was in, uh, in the grounds of the old Nonsuch Palace. Oh. And that was built in 1805, but it had crenellations. So it, it, what you've done is opened my eyes, actually, to seeing that use um, as an expression of power over hundreds of years. So thank you very much. Questions? We, we, we've got about t t 10 minutes of some, some questions before we can all go and have a drink. We can just go and have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had one. You, you, you showed us these wonderful flat roofs and then these um, acres of tiles, French roofs. So how did French castle builders start building cap flat roofs from, once they came to England? Because a flat roof in England, as I know from my little house down the road in Southampton, doesn't do very well in our time. <laughs> I mean, it's a phenomenon. The, the flat roof is really a phenomenon of the 14th century onwards in English architecture, and it's to do with leading, because they are, you need lead, because, of course, if you had a flat tile roof, it wouldn't keep the water off. Yeah. The point I'm trying to make is that having rectilinear buildings creates a completely different effect from the spectacular roofscape that is such a feature of French buildings. The English busy up their roofscapes with battlements and with chimneys. And if you, sorry, but I mean, if you look at Burley it's a, or, or Longleat or something, when you go onto the leads, it's like walking into an architectural forest with chimney pieces and battlements and things. And that's, that's, a, that's something that the English like and the French just don't really do. You know, they just see things differently. They do things differently. Yes. So on that note of roofs, uh, Castle Koch, of course, oh, yes. has the conical roof, so that's the exception that proves the rule, is it? Well, Castle Koch is entirely reconstructed yes, by Burgess. Yes. So, I mean, he's fan I mean, he's creating a brilliant fantasy. I mean, I don't think it would ever have looked like that originally. No, <laughs> this he, simple answer. he had to decide what to put on the roof, and he thought... Yeah, he and if you look at, I mean, lot you see lots of reconstruction drawings where people create conical roofs because they think that's what you do. But in fact, if you compare and contrast English and continental architecture, conical roofs do exist, but they're much rarer than you think. Um, and in Windsor, I don't know if you can visualise the bell tower at Windsor in the lower ward. It has a magnificent uh, conical roof, but it was in fact added at the suggestion of Napoleon the Third. Um, uh, to uh, the building, and if the original roof is actually, and the original bell cut is inside the building under the roof, 
Um, it's a really weird thing. But people think, I mean, just as with Disney, we, we, we think of castles with high roof lines. But when you look at the beginning, I did a slightly frivolous piece last Christmas on the Disney castle in country life, because it so fascinates me. I just think it's such a weird and wonderful thing. But, I mean, it's not evoking an English building. It's clearly evoking something much closer to the Trerischer or a German building than something English. And there's a painting in the, in, I can't remember the artist, but there's a painting in, in the show of, uh, it's nice century of um, Cork Castle, of yeah. reconstruction, with conical roofs. There's a walking park. In that's there. right, it's, it's, uh, that, I saw that, that's an art painting. It, that's copying, sorry, this is, I'm such a stamp collector. That's actually copying <laughs> an, in, uh, a, a, an engraving of a lost painting um, of that, just ah, oh, really? <laughs> uh, and because uh, I, I mean, it's it's nonsense, and it's very, but it's very distinct. There's an 18th century engraving done of a lost painting, which purports to be a view of Corfe. Um, In fact, it's a, a completely misunderstood um, and inaccurate yeah. copy. Explains it. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> um, I've been working with Matthew Johnson at both. Oh yes. Uh, we've had quite a lot of different people come to us and ask us questions about the roofs of Birmingham, because we we have uh, you know plenty of information. Yeah. on or around the crenellations. Um, but obviously, you know, we have then have the discussion about guttering. Yeah, and the flashing. Yeah. Stuff like that. Um, but one of the people, David Martin, who kind of dug around there, he is convinced that uh, they found a kind of triangular slate um, near one of the towers in the moat. So he's of the view mm. that the, yeah, high pitch. the corner towers, which are round, mm. possibly had conical roofs. And then there's a discussion about the rest of the roofs being low, leaded roofs, but then maybe with a pitched roof for the chapel. And, you know. It's not in. Com it's not completely impossible. But again, you know, showing that I've spent much more time thinking about these things than I should have done if I were a rational human being. The only place I'm aware of that has conical roofs and corner towers that we actually know they existed in the 14th century is Farley Hungerford, where there are drawings of the late uh, 18th century showing conical roofs. So they do exist, but I think it's extremely unlikely uh, at Bodium partly because the person who's almost certainly overseeing it was Henry Yeavely, I mean, were involved at some level, and uh, partly because nothing else looks like that in the southeast. So I would say it's very, very unlikely, but it's not to say it's impossible, it's not to say it may not be altered later, um, but just generally I would say no in the well, southeast. the thing is that Dallingbridge had a lot of experience with continental castles. So he does, yeah. He may have brought some of their ideas. He could have done. And he may have gone for some very unsafe. Yes, I mean, I still tend to think it's unlikely, but I mean, you're quite right, it's not impossible. Yeah, okay, yeah. and if uh, we could just find that bit of slate. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it's just gone missing. They're very, sorry, there was somebody at the, at the back, was it? Somebody else? Yes. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. 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 Um, that wonderful uh, topographical representation of Richmond Castle, which reminded me very much of a Southampton Terrier, which does the same thing for the town walls here, but that yeah. property is limited. Could you tell us a bit about the document? Yeah, it's in, gosh, I feel slightly guilty about this. It's in the, uh, the, the, the a register of the Honour of Richmond. It's a manuscript now in the British Library. It uh, was partly transcribed in the 18th century. It, it, it has a counterpart illustration, which shows William the Conqueror giving an open charter to the founding of knights of the honour of Richmond. It's almost impossible to date because uh, it's in, it actually shows the knight service of the castle as it must have existed in the 1190s, and it clearly isn't, I mean, it's, it's much later than that. And there's sort of internal evidence which implies to my mind that it's done at the late, um, around 1400. I notice very recently the British Library have redated on their website this manuscript to the 1470s or 1480s. And I, I can't now reconstruct why I dated it when I did, but when I looked at it, I thought there was some reason why it had to be earlier than that, but I don't know. And they may have some killer piece of evidence that does make it rather later. Uh, but I, uh, so it's something I, 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 don't re I haven't really pursued, but I think my memory of internal evidence it has to be a bit earlier, but I could be wrong. Um, you use the phrase, if you believe that Caesar had built a tower, do you actually think that people did believe that, or is it surely not just 
part of the myth? Well, it's an interesting question, isn't it? I mean, I think um, if you read Lady Anne Clifford in writing in the mid-17th century about her castles, if you remember the Caesar's Tower and the Pagan Tower, she explicitly writes that they're found built by the Roman legions. So, I mean, I think that... The, and there is, I feel, after all, the space for that kind of belief in... Um, uh, uh, in, 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 in. I mean, even at Warwick, the two towers on the front, which are two of the most ambitious castle towers of, of, of the Middle Ages in England, survive. You know, one of them is called Caesar's Tower, and one of them is called Guy's Tower. Guy, of course, being the found Guy of Warwick, the sort of founding figure of that castle. But I mean, they seem to be calling Caesar's Tower Caesar's Tower pretty much when they finish it. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't really understand. I mean, maybe there is something willful in it too, but I think that there certainly is a degree um, of belief in this. And um, in, the, in the 18th century, King writes about the ignorant thinking that uh, towers were built by Julius Caesar. When I, was, um, when I was a lot younger, we lived for a little while in India, and I remember trying to find monuments when, uh, uh, which I knew existed in remote parts of the landscape, <laughs> and going and asking villagers and things when they were built or where things were. And first of all, they never wanted to disappoint you, but secondly, they would point out the most extraordinary things as being monuments. You know, and, and I feel that there is that capacity for complete misunderstandings about what the history of things are uh, and what they represent. So I, I think... Probably less and less earnestly, but I mean, I certainly feel in the 13th and 14th centuries, probably people did. Um, and uh, Edward the First construction of Carnarvon, of course, is based on what seems a spectacular myth that he just found the body of the father of Constantine. I mean, it just seems totally improbable. And yet he spent a small defence budget building a new capital of Wales because of it. I mean, I think, so I think that it, with a little bit of goodwill and good intention, I think you can transport yourself into that world fairly easily. <laughs> Sorry, it's on, on that platform, is that this in Thomas Barry where he identifies uh, a joyous guard as either Annick or Bamber, having actually been on expedition? To there, yes, and he yeah. identifies them too and sees that. It's Annick, some people say it's Bamber. Indeed. It's, I mean, I think you do have to be, a, you know, you have to be circumspect about these things, don't you, a little bit? And I feel that there definitely is the line that you sell. Um, and, and I think it's rather a confusing thing also that people can simul... I mean, you, um, you know, we know, after all, Henry VIII has in his map collection projections of maps as we would understand maps, and, but he also has medieval mappa mundi. And we tend to think of the two as being mutually exclusive. I'm fascinated with something like Guy of, the legend of Guy of Warwick, how people were able to... You know, we know that Henry V, for example, went on pilgrimage to go and see the cave in which Warwick... Guy of Warwick purportedly died. And it strikes me it's a little bit like um, going and visiting Platform 9 and 3 quarters at King's Cross. <laughs> I mean, the degree to which you know, these things, you know, they, they sort of become real. You know, I mean, I, I'm always staggered that people are prepared to queue up to stand at a half-buried trolley in, 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 in something that's moved around King's Cross, and yet it somehow... Reality and fantasy so knowingly and willingly intersect there, don't they? Um, and I, I, th I think it's a very difficult thing to unpick. It's not that we don't know that things are objectively different, and yet, but we're quite happy to live with the fantasy too. Um, sorry, that's sort of an answer to all these different questions and not really an answer to anything. Yeah, so, yeah, you have a nice independent bookshop at King's Cross. Is there a Harry Potter memorabilia? <laughs> Hideous. Um, one more? Okay, drink time. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much Thank you.